There are seasons in life when we just don't understand what's going on. We've tried and we've done everything that God told us to do and it seems like it's just not working. No one's around to encourage us, no cheerleaders. It's in those seasons, in those darkest hours. I'm here today to tell you, you got to trust him when you can't trace him. You got to hold on because what's for you will be yours. You'll make it. Now listen. There are days that I don't think I can make it. Some head and heart aches. Just don't think I can shake it. But God, He knows just how much I can bear. And never will He leave me in despair. It may be hard right now, but some way, somehow, God will work it out. Yes, when I'll make it. Tell them about it. There have been times that I had rather given up on life. Tell the story, man. My brightest time of the day seemed to be at midnight. There's many times that I felt on my mind. And right now I feel so alone. Hmm. But I know that God will never leave me on my own. It may be hard right now, but some way, somehow, God will work it out. Witness without making it. I know. Without a shadow of a doubt, that is hard. But some way, but some way, somehow, God will work it out, and that's when I'll make it. It may be hard right now, but some. you told them you know we've just come through the most difficult season in our lives and one thing I've learned about God is that he's everything he ever promised he would be and I want to say to you today it's not so much of what you're going through my brother my sister it's about what you're going to you're gonna make it it's gonna be all right
Well, grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I can tell you how excited I am to see you this day. Listen, I've been waiting for the last few days just to get back here with you. I believe that this is not a meeting of chance or happenstance. I believe you tuned in today. God's getting ready to cause a supernatural collision between where you are and where you really want to be. I believe this day is going to set the stage for a new trajectory in your life. So I need you to hit that share button for me. That's all you got to do. I won't ask you to do anything else. You do that. I'm going to take care of the rest of it. Hit that share button. Help me spread this great gospel literally around the globe from continent to continent, zip code to zip code, area code to area code. Uh, hit that share button, start watch parties, text, tweet, inbox, yell down the hallway if you have to. Get everybody around the largest device uh, so that they can partake in this virtual experience. We're getting ready to go into our amazing praise and worship. It's going to set the stage, prepare the ground of your heart to receive what God wants to say to us today. And immediately after that, I promise you, I'm going to be right back here. I got something I think you're going to want to hear. Stay tuned. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. No one can fathom the greatness of our God. He is all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful. What a mighty God we serve. There is no one greater. There is no one greater. There is no one greater. So that's why we praise him. So right where you are, I want you to saturate your atmosphere with his praises. Open your mouth and bless the Lord. Open your mouth and give him glory because you know that he's worthy. God, we give you praise, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We honor you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on and bless his name. You are strong and mighty. There's no one else like you. You are great and powerful. No one can do the things you do. You're the beginning and the end. You're the peace I find within. You're a great God. You are great. You're a great God. You are great. Hallelujah. Nobody 
join in with me? Oh, how great is our God. Won't you sing with me? How great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. One more time, let's lift it up. Oh, how great. Praise God to everywhere. I want you to get your Bibles, your iPads, your iPhone, whatever it is that you have the Word of God secured on. And I want to call your attention uh, to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 7. Jeremiah, chapter 7. And I want to read into your hearing verses 23 through 27. And then I want to give attention to verse number 16. Here the beginning of the reading of the word of God. But I gave them this command, obey me and I will be your God and you will be my people. Walk in obedience to all I command you that it would go well with you. But they did not listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed the stubborn inclinations of their evil hearts. They went backward and not forward. From the time your ancestors left Egypt until now, day after day, again and again, I sent you, my servants, the prophets. But they did not listen to me or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and did more evil than their ancestors. When you tell them all of this, they will not listen to you. When you call to them, they will not answer. Verse number 16, I'm fascinated with it. So God says, so do not pray for this people, nor offer any plea or petition for them. Do not plead with me, for I will not listen to you. Wait a minute. This is God. This sounds a bit absurd for God to say. So he says to Jeremiah, so don't even pray for this people. 
nor offer any plea or petition for them. Do not plead. I, I don't even want to talk about them. For I, God, will not listen to you. I want to talk to you from the subject when God takes you off the prayer list. When God takes you off the prayer list. In the seventh chapter of Jeremiah, there are some pretty heavy indictments that are levied against the children of Israel. And God himself accuses them and indicts them for having selective amnesia. They have forgotten and quite easily, I might add, that it was the God of heaven who had brought them out, who had emancipated them from the bondages of slavery. And they get out into a place of liberty and uh, they immediately seem to have a lapse of memory in terms of what God expected from them based on what he had done for them. And they had gotten out of the bondages of Egypt and they were free and uh, they now have forgotten God to the point that they are now starting to worship idol gods. Israel had begun to mimic the behavior of their heathen neighbors. The one time worshiping nation were now thieves. They were murderers. And the greatest charge of all that had been levied against them by God is that now they were worshiping idol gods. Their, their once intense and all-consuming worship of God had now been done away with and they had started burning incense to Baal. Needless to say that God had taken serious issue with this inexcusable behavior and Israel had no clue. They didn't even realize that they were only moments away from feeling the anger and the wrath of God. And so in response to the children of Israel's rebellion and rejection of him, he sends the prophet Jeremiah to confront them. He was summoned and dispatched by God to the gates of the temple where he was to intercept the children of Israel before they walked into worship. At this encounter, the prophet's assignment was to detail and warn them of the offenses they had committed against God. The prophet Jeremiah was to appeal to their conscience and to plead to them that they would repent now for turning their backs on their God. And so God had given the prophet specific instruction with regard to his duty. He says, Jeremiah, what I want you to do is I want you to tell them exactly what I say. But it is at this point in the conversation between God and Jeremiah that it gets both interesting and confusing at the same time. He says to Jeremiah, he says, your assignment is to tell the people exactly what I say. Don't deviate from the dialogue. Don't interject anything other than what I'm telling you to say. But your mission will not be successful because the people will not, will not hear you. Can you imagine the discouragement that had to have overtaken Jeremiah to get an assignment from God to discharge the duty of saying to people what God tells him to say and then God adds the addendum and says you're going to tell them what I say but they will 
not listen. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing that causes more emotional injury and mental unrest than when your efforts are not responded to and when your investments are not acknowledged and what you have to give is not appreciated, which presents to us the question that I'm sure Jeremiah is thinking, but he doesn't want to say to God, is that God... So why even bother? God, help me preach. Jeremiah is hearing in one ear that God says, I need you to carry out the assignment of telling the people what I say for you to tell them, but then knowing that no matter what I say to them, they're not going to hear me. And Jeremiah is wondering, so God, why bother? Because God, if you know that they are not going to respond if you know that people are going to pay me no mind if you know that people are going to treat me as if I wasn't there then I have a question for you I don't mean any disrespect but why bother I don't I don't mean to cross the line and I don't mean to put myself equal to you but God why bother Oh, it's a question that all of us have asked at one point in our life. When you recognize your investment is greater than your return, why bother? Uh, when you have more pay-ins than you have paybacks, why bother? When you keep extending yourself to people who barely notice it, why even bother? Why keep giving all of you and everything you got to people who never say thank you? because they have this strong sense of entitlement and they just feel like what you do, you just have to do for them. God, why even bother? As soon as you need people you've helped, they get selective amnesia, so why bother? As soon as you need help from people you've invested in, they treat you like you're imposing and like you're an inconvenience. So my question is, God, why even bother? But if you're not careful, ladies and gentlemen, people's lack of response to your effort, your commitment, your sacrifice, their disregard to your sacrifice can potentially cause you to become cold and callous and bitter and come to the conclusion that I'm not doing nothing for nobody else. Oh, I know you got to keep your cute church face on. And you never got to that point where it looks like no matter what you did, it didn't make a difference. Nobody valued it. Your voice was just as good to silence to them anyway they didn't value your opinion and you wondered why even Bob I'm not loving anybody else I'm not getting in another relationship I'm not helping anybody else so God my question to you is why even bother that is the position that God has put the prophet Jeremiah in because God tells him, go talk to them and tell them of their ways. But he says they're not going to hear you. So God, what's the point? Why bother anyway? I'm not, I'm not getting it. Why should I bother? Ladies and gentlemen, why bother? The reason that you have to do what God is telling you to do is because you can't let being offended stop you from being obedient. God, help me preach. Um, now I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that there are times in all of our lives when our efforts are met uh, with nonchalant responses. There are going to be moments where you've sacrificed everything you had only for people to look at it and marginalize it and minimize your effort. Uh, but he says, Jeremiah, you still have to go because you can't let you, you being offended stop you from being obedient because, ladies and gentlemen, believe me when I tell you that nothing causes the favor of God to overwhelm and overtake you like when you are in compliance to what it is God told you. Here it is. Sometimes you have to do it for no other reason than because God said so. Ushers, that's my cue right there. Uh, sometimes you got to do it 
Because God says so. When, when there is no immediate response to your effort, when there is no foreseeable reward for your labor, you have to do it. Because God said do it. I, oh, I, I can't tell you how many times there have been moments that I thought I'm not doing this for them. I'm not going to participate in that. I, and God said, yeah, you're going to do it. Because I am your God and, uh, and sometimes you got to be and walk in a posture of obedience because God told you. It's like, I, I don't know how you grew up, but when I grew up, my parents weren't big on a whole lot of dialogue. Um, they seem not to be interested in giving me a detailed explanation as to why they wanted me to do what they wanted me to do. And whenever I thought to inquire, they would look at me and say, you won't do it because I said so. No, no long explanation, ladies and gentlemen, because if you're not careful, you will allow being rejected by people to have a bad taste in your mouth and you will become offended. And when you are offended, it usually becomes the precursor for you walking in a place of disobedience, but you got to do it even though it doesn't look like it's making any headway. You got to do it sometimes when it doesn't look like it's making any difference or people are valuing your contribution because you can't let being offended stop you from being obedient to God. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeremiah is wondering, God, why are you telling me to do this? If you know they're not going to hear me. Why are you commanding me to do this if you know that they're not going to receive me? It's because you can't let being offended stop you from being obedient. But there's another reason. Because it's for the benefit of others who are observing you. Oh, God, I, I, I've got to do it for the benefit of those who are observing me because whether you know it or not, there are people watching you that you don't even know are watching you. And they, they are observing your character and your walk because anybody talks a good talk, but there are people who are observing you. Just when you thought nobody noticed you, nobody was paying attention to you, let me assure you that there is somebody watching you right now and they are watching you to see and they are observing how you respond when you are being mistreated. They are observing when you are being overlooked, very obviously. They are looking at your face, your body language, your action. They are observing you to see how you're going to respond because what you do not know and what God has not let you in on is that sometimes God uses you for visual aid for somebody else's faith. God, I feel like dancing now because what you must understand is that sometimes your trial has nothing to do with you, but it's for the benefit of somebody else's faith. Because when they see you going through what you're going through and still call God good, it's worth being bothered. Lord, help me. Somebody who felt like you couldn't get any further was watching your grind and your refusal to be average and it motivated them to do more. Somebody who felt like they couldn't be any bigger, they couldn't accomplish more in life, but they start watching your grind and your work ethic and your refusal to be denied and that motivated them. Somebody needs to see that even if your mama dogged you out, you can still survive. God, if your daddy abandoned you, you could still make it. Even if your family is jealous of you, you could still move beyond this moment. Even if your husband walked away for no apparent reason and no explanation, you can still make it. Even if you're a single parent with no help, no support from anybody, you can still make it. Even if you lost everything right now, you can still make it. Because the truth is, if you lost everything now and still had God, you got enough to start all over again I feel like praising right through here because there's somebody that's watching me I want to tell you that even though it doesn't look like nothing is changing nothing is moving at the end of the day you have to be committed to doing what God has told you to do ladies and gentlemen he calls this prophet and gives him assignment but then he tells him and makes him aware that they're not going to hear you Jeremiah's wondering, God, 
Why bother anyway? What's the point anyway? And God says you do it anyway. Lay your hands on yourself and say, I got to do it anyway. At the end of the day, you got to decide, am I doing what he's told me to do for the applause of people or am I doing it because God told me to do it? Uh, every now and then you got to look at people and say I, I can't I can't tell you everything about it but all I can tell you is that God told me to do it and Jeremiah relinquishes his will to the will of God and according to Jeremiah chapter 7 God does something that messes with most people's theology God looks at Jeremiah and tells him that you are forbidden to pray to, for me, to me, for them. Uh, he says, don't make any petition for them. Don't even beg me because I'm not going to hear when you pray. Oh, God. That, that, that's messing with somebody now because there, there have been a lot of instances in your life where people have said, I'm going through a whole lot right now, and you said something like, I'm going to pray for you. Weeks have passed, months have passed, nothing's changed about their life, their circumstance. Could it be possible that you're talking to God about somebody God doesn't want to talk about. Uh, that, that you're bringing up a subject matter that God is not interested in. God said, Jeremiah, I've warned them time and time again. I've given them chance after chance after chance. I, I've extended mercy and grace unto them, but they still would not listen to me. But I want you to know that because they didn't listen to me, I'm not going to listen to you when you try to talk to me about them. Uh, I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it's a little mind-blowing to think that the God of heaven will not hear you. Uh, uh, I could deal with a lot of things. I could deal with you not hearing me. I could deal with somebody turning a deaf ear on me. But what happens when God decides that I don't want to talk about them? Uh, what a tragedy it would be for somebody to be down on their knees saying, God, I want you to bless Bolden. And God says, I don't even want to talk about him. Uh, we could talk about anything else but that because I want you to understand that the grace of God is not a license to do what you want to do. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that there was a time that God winked at your ignorance. But after you've been in an environment of instruction and impartation, and you still don't want to listen, you still don't want to comply, you, you still don't want to obey God, he told the prophet, take them off the prayer list. Lord, I want to preach to somebody and tell you, that there is a place that you can get in God according to this document in Jeremiah chapter 7 where God will delete you from the conversation. Uh, where God will remove your petition from the prayer list. But God says that I don't want to talk to you now because when I try to talk to you, you put everything else before me. You had no time for me, you had no reference for me, and you had no regard for me. So he says to Jeremiah, don't pray for them or offer any plea or petition for them. Uh, and do not plead with me for I, God, will not listen to you. Uh, I want to preach to somebody and tell you whatever you got to do, to make it right with God, you better do it right now before God takes you off the prayer list. Yeah, wouldn't it be a mind-blowing thing, the thing that you could be praying night after night and day after day and don't even recognize that you're not on the prayer list anymore. Uh, you got to make, how do I get back in the presence of God? He says you got to change those rebellious ways and, and not only do you have to change your rebellious attitude, but you got to repent now 
before your God. Say, I know I lost shouters now because we want to do whatever we want to do and not realize that until you repent before God, that God says this conversation is over. Lord, help me preach. Uh, that's why as a believer, you got to look at repentance as a right that the believer has to get back in the good graces of your God. He says that when you repent and turn from your evil ways, then I would hear you. That's what he told him. That, that, that's what he told him. He said that, that if my people, God help me, uh, would, would turn from their evil ways and, and, and repent to me, then I will hear from heaven. But I wanted to stop by and tell somebody, while you're so busy telling everybody, pray for me and say a little prayer for me. You could be under the impression that God is interested in talking to you or about you. Because there's a place where you will give a God God said, I don't care who prayed to me for you. I'm not going to hear you until you initiate some repentance and some change for your behavior. Look at how far I brought you, Israel. Israel had the nerve to burn incense to Baal six days a week. And then they wanted to run in the temple on the Sabbath day and God put Jeremiah right at the entrance of the temple but they still wouldn't hear him. I'm talking to somebody now who showed up for worship. You say, I'm, at least I can do is give God this one day but you're giving the world the rest of your time. You're investing your time, energy, effort into the things of the world and God says, hey, tell them I will take you off the prayer list. I don't care what prophet lays hands on you. I don't care who puts all on your head. When I decide I don't want to hear anything about you, what a terrible place to be when God says, I don't want to hear anything. I'm preaching to people now. Here it is. So you're, um, you're not watching me. I'm not praying for cars or Cadillacs or clothes, none of that stuff. I'm praying that you would dismiss that amnesia you've taken on that lapse of remembrance to what God has done for you, where God has brought you from, and that you would repent because God, I've forgotten, how did I get so free? When I was liberated, when I was stuck in Egypt, all I had to do was pray and thank you and honor you and worship, but the moment you get free, you start doing your own things and start doing what everybody else is doing. But God says, for this people, if I am going to hear you, hear this, you have got to hear me. If you would hear my voice, I'm going to hear your voice. Stretch your hand toward me as I'm praying for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm praying for every person who has found themselves in places and, and they know they've gone too far. They haven't found a, point, a place to make a U-turn as of yet. They know they've only getting deeper and deeper and further and further away from your will. They know that what they're doing is not becoming of who they say they are. They're going so far and don't realize that you can get to a place where God will take you off the prayer list. God says, who him? I don't, don't bring him up. He said, Jeremiah, don't mention their name to me. Don't beg for them. Don't plead for them. Because when I try to instruct them, they would not hear. So God, I'm praying now that you would give favor and grace over these your people who will now say, God, I will hearken unto you. My ears will be open to hear what it is that you have to say to me. And I will make the amendments and the adjustments necessary to walk in the state of blessing that you would have me to be. And I pronounce it on your life and it cannot be otherwise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. You ought to give God praise right where you are. Well, perhaps this is the most important part of the service, apart from hearing the Word of God, is to let that Word uh, provoke you, challenge you, stimulate a desire to be saved um, and in relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is your moment. 
please hear me, don't mistake this. Don't let it pass you by. This is for you. If nobody was watching but you today, God would be speaking for you and telling you that this is your moment. His arms are wide open. He's waiting uh, for you this day. And I want to offer Jesus Christ to you. It's a very simple process. No 12-week classes, no meeting with 24 elders. Simply confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and he's even now seated on the right hand of the Father making intercession for you. That literally means while I'm talking to you, he's talking to the Father concerning you. This is your moment. What are you going to do with this opportunity? Maybe you're saying, you know, I messed up so badly, so horrifically, God could not possibly want anything else to do with me. Let me tell you, you couldn't be further from the truth. God is as much in love with you today as he's ever been in all of your life. All you got to do is surrender your heart, your mind, your soul, and your will. And say, God, if you can use anybody here, I am. Or maybe you're watching and say, Bishop, I hear you, but I got a relationship with him. What I need is a church home. I need a pastor. I need, I need to be in worship in an environment with people who are esteeming and lifting up the marvelous name of Jesus Christ. And uh, if that's you today, I want to tell you, you are making the best decision you will ever make in life. There's an email right here at the bottom of the screen. Just contact us, send me your contact information. I got staff on standby now. They are, they are anxiously waiting to be able to serve you and help facilitate this next move in your decision for salvation with Jesus Christ. Heavens rejoice and so am I. Our church family here, we are rejoicing to have you not just a part of the kingdom of God, but if you are coming as a part of this family, we want to say welcome to you. And I can't wait to see what God does with your life. God bless you. Well, we are at an amazing point in the service. This is our global giving opportunity. It is an amazing privilege uh, for those of us who are believers, who are seed sowers, who understand the principles of uh, investing in kingdom. This is an exciting moment for us because this moment affords you and I the opportunity to decide and determine how much more increase we have the capacity to receive. The Bible says that except the grain of wheat falls to the ground and died about it alone. But if that same grain of wheat falls to the ground, it brings forth much fruit. Seed has to make its way to the ground uh, so that the harvest can make its way to your house. And on this day, I believe that God has every intention on blessing his people miraculously. I decree increase, incredible income opportunities. I decree now that God's sending resources from places you didn't even know existed. But then we have to do our part, and then our part of that is to make the initial investment. That if we give, then, then God would give. He will call the earth to yield up his bounty. On this day, I want you to prepare the Lord's tithe. Let's do that first. First things first. Let's prepare the Lord's tithe. It's a tenth of everything God allows it to come into your hand. It's not limited to a paycheck or every two-week two week, two week pay cycle. Whatever comes in your hand, God says, if you get in the habit and the practice of instinctively honoring me with the first of it, he says, I'll bless you as long as you live and I'll bless you down to the fourth generation. So I want you to tie the giving means right here at the bottom of the screen. I want you to honor the Lord with a tie. It's a tenth, not a fifth, not two thirds, not a quarter. But if you bring God the honorable tent, you can do more to bless 10% than you'll ever do with a curse 100%. That I know for sure. I'm living proof of that. As you're preparing your tithe, do that, release it. Now, I want to challenge as many of you this day that would hear my voice, that would more importantly hear the spirit of the Lord concerning this giving moment. I need at least 200 of you that will simply make a $70 kingdom investment on this day. For some of you, that's a drop in the bucket. For some of you, it's going to require sacrifice. And I want to tell you some of the greatest harvests I've had came on the other side of a stretching moment, of an invitation to stretch and to sacrifice. And that's what I'm offering you this day. Some of you can peel it off easily, but some of you, you're really at a place where you're trusting God. So I need at least 200 of you that would say, Bishop, I'm standing with you this day. You can count on me. Count me in. I'm one of the ones that are going to sow that $70 seed. Of course, I always have people who are going to give $700, $1,000, $2,000. You're always out there. You always come through for us. But then there's those of you who say, Bishop, if I had the 70, I would certainly give it, but God knows I don't have it. Well, I know you can't give what you don't have. 
but I want you to stretch even this day. I want, you can't give that 70, I want you to give 50, get 45, get the $42 corporate seed in your hand. It may be five, whatever it is that puts you in a position where you are saying to God, this is my stretch today. And I wanna tell you that God's gonna honor your stretching. And as you begin to give, you're going to see tremendous ways and harvest break out in your life like never before. All the giving means right at the bottom of the screen. Find the one that's the most convenient for you and give. If you don't give electronically, I get it. Uh, there's a mailing address right there. You want to mail it, get a stamp, envelope, a money order, cashier's check, send it in to us. We're going to pray over it and pronounce heaven's best on your seed. Listen, go ahead and give. Watch how heaven responds to this seed today. Family, didn't we enjoy the presence of God on today? I know service was just amazing. I know you felt the presence of the Lord right there, wherever you're watching us from. Right now, it's giving time, and we want to make sure that we sow into the man of God's life. He's delivered a powerful word to uplift us and teach us and to encourage us and strengthen our faith. And now is your opportunity to participate in sowing and seed into the man of God's life. So easy to do. You can go to his personal cash app at dollar sign Henry W. Bolden 3. Yeah, that's right, dollar sign, Henry W. Bolden 3. Or you can go to his personal website at henrybolden.com. Go ahead, sow a good seed into the man of God's life. God bless you. You already know what I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask, where did the time go? Man, it seems like we just got started. Start getting good. I hate to leave you. God knows I do, but I pray, um, as I always do, that you have been blessed, that you have gleaned some principles, some insight, um, some nugget of truth that's going to help you in your faith walk as you uh, journey into this incoming week that I hope this message resonates in your heart and your mind and your spirit and your faith walk is blessed because of it. Uh, don't forget to stay connected to me. Follow me on all of our social media platforms. Stay connected. There is a blessing in connection and you do not want to miss that. Um, don't forget uh, to join us on Sundays, each and every Sunday uh, for in-person service. You can do that now at 9 a.m. We'd love to see you uh, if you're able to come. People are coming from out of town. People are flying in uh, just to be a part of one of our live services. And I want to take a moment to invite you uh, to be our guest as well. Well, I've got to go, but as always in parting, let me always remind you that things can change for you at any moment. I'll see you next time.